Come on, as it is in heaven, are you expected in Counter Church? Come on, are you ready to give Jesus some praise this morning? Those of you online, stand on your feet and let's give Jesus Christ praise. Amen. Come on, every praise belongs to our God this morning. Amen, church. Yeah, yeah. Every praise is to our God And every word of worship in one accord Every praise, every praise is to our God Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah to our God Glory hallelujah, it's to our God Every praise, every praise is
Church, let's celebrate the King of Kings this morning. Amen. Are you excited to be in the house? That's very good. And I trust you're just as excited to honor God with your substance, with your tithes, with your offerings. I haven't been here for a while, so I want to give you a great word of encouragement before I take all your money. <laughs> I'm just doing that because I know it's a, a yo, this mic is violent. It's just a lot of echo. Can I maybe have the civilian mic, please?
Hello. Is that better, church? Is it better? Help me, encourage me. <laughs> Are you ready to honor God with your tithes, with your offerings? I want to get into some stuff this morning. I'm not about taking people's money. I'm not about coercing people. I'm not that pastor. I don't need your money. But God needs your stewardship, which is the most important thing. If we get into the book of Genesis, we see Adam and Eve tending to the garden. What were they? They were stewards. But something went wrong. They fell into sin. They got drop kicked out of the garden. And then we get Cain and Abel. That is where we see Abel give the first offering to God. Then we meet a man, Abraham which is our father of faith, who encountered uh, Jesus Christ, I mean Melchizedek. He met Jesus, not Melchizedek. I know your Bible says Melchizedek, but if we get into that, it was a Christophany. It was Jesus Christ. And he did what? He gave a tithe of all. Then we see Moses and the people of flesh, the people of flesh who needed a law to give tithes. They needed law to give tithes. Then we see Jesus Christ come. The Messiah takes no tithes. Why? He had no church. Are you guys okay? I'm just giving a quick history lesson. I'm not a historian, so it's probably wrong. <laughs> I'm mess you up properly this morning. I want you to enjoy giving. The problem is we don't give because we don't know the Bible. When you don't know the Bible, you can't have the joy of your salvation. Amen. Because the Bible tells you exactly who you are. I want you to get that. Because now people is like, but Jesus didn't take tithes. Yes, he didn't. He didn't have a church. Who receives tithes? The church. The Levites. But even the Levites, they still tithe to Abraham. Why? Because the Levites came out of Abraham's loins. So they still tithed. So we can leave the Old Testament, New Testament nonsense because I'm going to show you the New Testament church. And you're going to understand why I'm talking like this. So when did the law fall away? As soon as Jesus Christ gave His life for you and I. Amen. Say, I am encouraged. I need you to be encouraged, but I need you to know the word when you give. So that when you give, it carries revelation and power. The Bible says that a people cast off restraint where there is no revelation, where there is no prophetic vision. Are you guys with me? This is how you become successful. So the Bible in 1 Timothy 6 verse 7 says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. So now you must get ready because now I'm going to take all your money. Because the Bible says you, you came here with nothing and you're leaving here with nothing. Remember, you came into the world, not came into church with nothing. If you came into church with nothing, it's a sin. <laughs> I'm joking. Relax. <laughs> The problem is you're not sure if I'm telling you the truth or not. And the Bible says the truth you know shall set you free. No word that comes off the pulpit is supposed to bind you. It can only bind you if you don't know the truth. That is how the devil steals from so many believers because they don't know the truth in the word. So all they feel is condemnation. But this is not condemnation that we preach. We preach the love and the grace of God. Are you guys with me? Let's do some more Bible. Acts 20, verse 35. It says, I have shewed you all things, how that so laboring he ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive, which tells me that the way of a believer to be blessed is when they give, not in receiving. If I find a believer that is full of the joy of the Lord, it is because they're a giving Christian. 
It is the nature of Jesus Christ to give. Why? So that the blessing of the Lord can come upon them. And the Bible says that it is the blessing of God which makes one rich and adds no sorrow to it. Say New Testament church. Say the Spirit-filled church. Say tithes. Say offerings. Say a tithe of all. Now let's go to Acts 4, verse 31. Now this section of Scripture is called the answer to their prayer. And I want you to remember that. And it says here, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. How many of you know that at some of our services and encounter conferences that there's been a shaking in this building? And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Are you all filled with the Holy Ghost? And they spake the Word of God with boldness. It's very important that you speak the Word. Next verse. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own. You see, when there is a church that is of one heart and one soul, they will not see as the personal possessions that they have as their own. This is very important. And out of the things which he possessed was his own, and but they had all things in they had all things in. They had all things in. You see, you guys don't like sharing. <laughs> I think we must run church like this. Because that's how you're supposed to. And with great power. Wow. Did you see that? They had all things in common, but they also had great power. Did it say that the preacher had great power? No. It said that the multitude that was in the church had great power. You are supposed to have great power. How will you have great power when you have all things in common? When you have a life of abundance. Hmm. And they gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace. So they had great power and they had great grace. And it was upon them. Was it just on Pastor Chris? Was it just on Pastor Martin? Was it just on Pastor Marie? Was it just on prophets? Who was it on? Who was it on? Who was it on? Amen. Next verse. <laughs> Neither was there any among them that lacked. So what does that mean? They completely destroyed poverty. They completely destroyed poverty. Mm. And watch the proof. For as many as were possessors, were they renting? 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 What did they do? They possessed. They possessed lands. Ah. <laughs> All houses. But watch this. They sold them. And they brought the prices of these things that were sold. And laid them down at the apostles' feet. Watch this. They didn't give tithes, offerings, seeds, and then come tell Pastor Chris, this is how you use the tithes and the offerings, and this is what you must do, a shush. And the distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. So this is what the church is supposed to do. Tend to the needs of the flock and the people. But how are we going to do this? When we begin to live a mentality, of stewardship so that we can have all things in common. 
there's not supposed to be division in the body of Christ. There's supposed to be an attitude and a hard attitude of that my life is not my own. I give it all to Jesus Christ. I give it all to Jesus Christ. See, the Bible says it is the blessing of God that makes one rich and adds no sorrow to it. But in the book of Deuteronomy, he says that you shall not forget the Lord your God. For it is He that has given you the power and the ability to get wealth so that you can answer His covenant. A covenant believer is one that builds the kingdom of God. And that is where you see the blessing of God that will rest on you and it will never leave you. If I find a believer that has to pay for everything, and I mean it like this, if you have to pay for everything, there is no favor on your life. There are many times I want something and favor, because favor is on me, I'll never have to pay for it. I have many times blessed people with something that I wanted and someone would come the following week and they would buy the very thing that I wanted, but I gave it away as a seed. Why? The favor of God. The favor of God works like this, where you can just think, wow, it'd be nice to have this. In three days time, you have that, but you have not gone out of your own to pay for it. Are you guys with me? So we need to begin to see our tithes, our offerings, our sowing, our resources, our assets, not as our property. We need to start seeing ourselves as stewards. When you see yourself as a steward, that debt, that bottom line is not for your account. It is for God's account. But if I now see myself as the owner, the CEO, and the possessor of all of these things, that account will be yours till kingdom come. I want you to get that. But when I lay my life down, I say, God, everything that you have given to me is yours. This is not my property. I'm just a steward of this. But I know when I'm a steward of what belongs to you. Remember I told you, come into this world with nothing. You will leave it with nothing. Why? Because the fullness of the earth is the Lord's and everything therein. We are taking possession and property of what belongs to God. Doesn't matter if it's money, if it's cars, if it's land, if it's buildings. It actually belongs to God. How do I know this? Because I'll leave this world with nothing. But if God owns it, and I'm a steward of what is His, it is not for my account. It doesn't mean now I can be lazy. No, because the Bible says that laziness will for sure lead to poverty. But yeah, we have a church that had completely abolished poverty. How? They were all faithful stewards. So I want you to be encouraged that as you give, let it be powered by the Word about what God says. You see, we carry on in that scripture and it mentions the people in the church. But then right at the end, it mentions just before you get to chapter 5, it mentions Barnabas. It mentions one person. Why? Because it is significant. He sold of his possessions, his land and his resources. And he also gave it to the apostles. But it's amazing when we get, I think it's to chapter 13 and 14, we see that man is in ministry. I want to share a testimony of you that when, when, when God spoke to prophet about planting the first church, there were some of the pastors, including myself, Pastor Martin, where God came and spoke to us to give everything that we have. Why? to plant the church and we have never looked back since and it's not that we are blessed or we are prospering it is the fact that God could take people like us and use us in ministry to preach the gospel why because this is a foundational tool it is one thing to give but when you say everything I have is yours I promise you now, you can be the next Benny Hinn, you can be the next Kenneth Copeland, you can be the, the next Billy Graham. Why? If you go look at all their lives, this is how their Christianity started. That's why it's called a foundational truth. Now the devil comes to destroy foundational truths for believers. Why? Because he knows that there is power in it. 
See, when we look at the power of the early church, this is what their giving did. They had great power. They had mighty power. They had exceeding great power. They had excellent power. They had eternal power. They had glorious power. They had divine power. That seven realms of power that that church moved in. Does it say that the apostles moved in that power? No, it was the congregation. The lack of power means that there is a lack of giving in your life. Because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Why? So that there could be resurrection power. So as you give this morning, as you give your tithes and your offerings, let there be resurrection power. I want everyone to stand to their feet. And those that are with us online, you will see that the giving details is here below. But I want you to take this word and be encouraged in your giving. I know for a lot of people, it can be difficult to give. But the Bible says that although you sow in tears, you shall surely come in the morning reaping armloads of blessing with joy. Do you see how important it is to know the Bible so that you can bring a contradiction to every suggestion that is trying to limit God from touching your life? So I want us all to lift up our sewing envelopes. You can lift up your cards if you're going to be giving at the back. And you can also lift up your cell phone if you're going to give electronically. And I want all of those with us on Encounter Now and YouTube to stretch, stretch their hands out to the screen that as we give, that Father, I thank you that as we give in this morning, that as your Bible declares, that as we give, it shall be added unto us our righteousness. May every single one of your people grow in the grace gift of giving. That may all good things according to the will of God abound in their lives. But Father, I pray that you'll sharpen our integrity and our humility. May every single one of us, even as we go into this fast, be set apart unto you. That you'll cause every ounce of our flesh to die and to be healed unto you so that we may grow in every area and capacity for the glory of God. But Father, I pray for every single person, may financial breakthrough be their portion, that because they have chosen to honor you and delight themselves in you first, that not one of their tithes and their offerings will be lost, that everything would come up before you as a sweet smelling aroma, that you would open up the windows of heaven and that you would pour out a blessing that there's not enough room to receive it. And Father, I pray that even as a demonstration where debt cancellation is required, may debt cancellation be their portion. Where a good clean bill of health is needed, may healing be their portion. Where there has been a lack of power, may power be imparted to every single one of them in Jesus Christ's name. But Father, we thank you, we bless you. And we thank you that you have given seed to the sower. We thank you that we can place our tithes and offerings on this altar that has been received by you, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. The church, you're so welcome to come to the front and give. And you can also make your way to reception if you'd like to give by card. And then for all those online, you can use electronic giving details at encounterchurch.co.za. And then, of course, for those in the United States, Europe, and our international viewers, you can also use the giving details below. We've got Venmo, Cash App, and also PayPal if you go and visit the website. So God bless you as you give, church. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. His name is Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, His name is Jesus, His name is Jesus, His name is Wonderful Counselor.
spirit in council receive a second offering which goes towards the vision fund and um i want to show you the power of giving so this morning i received the testimony i won't share the person's name because then you're going to all know he backslid see you're not laughing because you don't backslide eh no but watch how powerful this is so he was telling me he said pastor chris you know two three years ago when i backslid and he went into his old lifestyle he says i just realized now but i never used to give I never gave tithes or offerings. And this is really part of my testimony as well. And um, he said, but this time that I'm back, I have learned to give. I've learned to give tithes and offerings. He says, and my backslidden lifestyle and my old life has no hold over me. I don't know if you heard that. You see, we underestimate the power of giving. You see, if I give my money into the house and I backslide, It'll be very hard to leave and not come back. Why? Because you have too much pride. Because you still think that money is yours. But God uses that <laughs> to keep hold of you. It's a very simple principle. But what is that doing? It creates humility. Some people, oh, why must I give? Because God needs to humble you. If I need to be humbled, if Pastor Martin needs to be humbled, if Pastor Marie, Pastor Gerard, the worshipers need to be humbled on a continued basis, how much more so the congregation? Are you guys with me? So I want to encourage you as you give into the vision, this is one of the most powerful ways that you can give is by building the kingdom of God. As you give, you're equipping us and you're enabling us to go and reach more people and more souls. Amen. And of course, this goes towards all the building projects, the advancements of the vision as we, we share with you guys every week. So they're going to send the offering around. You're blessed to give as you feel led. And then you can also go to encounterchurch.co.za to give online and become a monthly partner of the vision. Or you can go to the back um, to give your seed. So God bless you as you give, church. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. His name is Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. His name is Wonderful Counselor. Amen. Thank you to all those that have given. Let's all stand together as we go into worship. As we go into worship, let's declare this morning that fear has no hold on us because we are no longer slaves to fear. Let's lift our hands. You unravel me with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone cause I'm no
hear that chorus. If you believe it, you're no longer safe to fear. Let's declare this this morning. I am a child of God. Let's lift up our hands. Let's sing it out. Yeah, yeah. We declare Jesus. We no longer slave. Cause I'm no longer
church we are singing oh Jesus
surface, it fills the temple. stand in your holy presence it is an honor to worship it is a privilege Lord something we do not take lightly your presence is so welcome in this place Lord we surrender we yield we submit to everything that you have got prepared for us even in this day Father I pray as such that every heart be open every spirit be unlocked to receive what it is that you have got prepared for us in this day that we will have the ability by your Spirit to reach out into eternity and to receive from that dimension all that you have and to bring it back into the here and the now where we can walk and become a divine expression of all who you are. Lord, we love you so much. We worship you. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. We give you all the praise in the living name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Come on, give God a praise offering. Just raise your hands to heaven. Just give God, just give God the best price of that you possibly can present in this day. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Welcome in Kana Church. I trust that you are excited to be at church this morning. I trust that each and every one of you are doing well. Amen. It is an honor and a privilege to be with you once again in this morning. I'm excited to get into whatever God has got planned for this day. Amen. And um, it is truly an honor and a privilege to minister the word onto each and every one of you that I love so much. Amen. Come on. How many of you can say that I've got a deep love and appreciation for the word of God? Amen. I hope that it's each and every one of you. I love his word. And it's truly an honor to, to minister His Word unto each and every one of you. But I trust that you are open and ready to receive in this day. Amen. Very warm welcome to 
everyone connecting with us online to all our online members it is awesome to be with you on this day i know that you're about to be blessed by the service in this day and uh on this morning rather how many of you can say that i can feel the presence of god right now be honest amen what an honor and a privilege is it not to be in his presence i love his presence amen I want to get into something this morning and I want to jump right into it because of time. I don't want to be caught. This is a message that I cannot afford not to finish this morning. If I finish it halfway, it will leave too many questions. So I have to get through it. And uh, it's going to be on two times speed. So uh, I will need you to, to stay with me on this morning. I trust that you are ready. Amen. I almost said, are you ready to honor the Lord with your substance? And... Um, Nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, it's, uh, there's an excitement in the atmosphere and God is busy, busy working, He's busy moving and I know that, that your lives are about to be touched and changed through the service in this day. Can I have an amen to that? And so that being said, we obviously started with a new series, The Presence of God, that I trust that you guys are enjoying and uh, this morning will be part three of the series and uh, I want to get into something. It's not my, my usual preaching, hallelujah, Sunday, Shandai, Shandai message. And, uh, but I do believe with all my heart that it is an extremely important message. I do believe with all my heart that it's a message in season and in time. I believe that it's by the Holy Spirit, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that this will come forth in this day. I pray that God will lead me to deliver the message in the way that it was ordained to be delivered and that you will receive it in the way that it's supposed to be received. Amen. That being said, I will need your undivided attention for the next 30 minutes or so as the enemy will come and try and steal this word from you. I can guarantee it. I will, it will require of you to focus and to really receive the word. If you can receive the word that I'm giving you this morning, I guarantee you that there will be spiritual acceleration. I guarantee you that there will be spiritual growth. I can guarantee you that you will have a greater, let me say it like this, that the connection that you have with God will be strengthened. Are you guys with me? And, uh, you know, I want to really touch on something in this morning that I've seen many being prevented or have prevented many from being able to enter into the presence of God, which is critical if we understand the importance of His presence, which is critical if you understand the importance of abiding to live and reside within His presence, to stay within His presence. And until this one thing changes you will not be able to experience deeper dimensions in God. We have preached many messages. We have many teachings. There's been many revelatory messages being given from this pulpit on the presence of God. What it is, how, you know, how does the presence of God work? How do we enter into the presence of God and how to even cultivate an atmosphere of His presence? Yet there is one key factor that many take so lightly and that many people tend to overlook that will cause them not to reach greater heights in God. This one key factor carries the possibility and the potential that will prevent you from having an intimate relationship with God. This one key factor can potentially prevent you from truly knowing God. And this one key factor is known as the hearts. Now I know that from the onset of my statements that when I made mention of this word heart that many of you already have closed off. Thinking that, okay, there we go. Another heart message, been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. But I want to encourage you in this morning to rather open your heart because the message that I'll be speaking on the heart in this morning is not your ordinary, normal, hallelujah, jumping up, having a heart after God's own heart message. Are you guys with me? Again, I state it will require your undivided attention. I can already see how many are drifting off. The enemy will try and prevent you from receiving these words. Why? Because he knows the impact 
that when you receive this, and I'm speaking into your heart and into your spirit, he very well knows and understands the impact that the, these words will have on your life. He knows that any barrier of limitation that have prevented the presence of God in your life is about to be removed by these words. It will require participation from your side not to get distracted. Amen. Again, I state that this key factor is known as the heart. And the foundational scripture that I want to use for the message in this morning comes out of Psalm chapter 24, New King James. Psalm chapter 24, verse 3 and verse 4. And it says, very well-known scripture, Who may ascend, Psalm chapter 24, verse 3 and 4, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in His holy place? And then the author gives the answer in verse 4 saying, He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. And this is truly my heart for each and every one of you this morning, even for those connecting with us over live stream. This is my heart and my prayer for each and every one of us, that we will come to a place where we can develop a spiritual state, a nature, an attitude, where we can have truly, really have clean hands and a pure heart before God so that we can come into His holy hills, onto the mountain of the Lord and where we can stand in His holy place with clean hands and a pure heart. This is truly my, my prayer for each and every one of you in this morning. I'll be together. Say my heart. Please understand that everything in life, everything in life, both physically and spiritually will be determined by the condition of your heart. I'm just laying a foundation. I have to lay this foundation. Otherwise, you will not understand what I'm getting into. And we all by now do understand that when it comes to God and the handling of spiritual matters, that it is indeed all about the hearts. God looks at the hearts. He looks at the hearts. Say my hearts. You guys with me? As the Bible says this in Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 10, New King James, just stay with me. I the Lord search the hearts. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruits of his doing. Now, when you take this verse and you rather read it from the back going to the front, meaning if you read it backwards, it means this, that the fruit that your life produces will be determined and will originate from the contents of your heart. It will be determined by the condition of your heart. The very way of your life will be set by what is happening in your heart. It will be set, it will be steered by the condition of your heart. Are you guys with me? As the Bible says that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You will manifest according to the contents of your hearts. Amen. Listen, show me the contents of your hearts and I will show you the condition of your life. And it's easy to determine the contents of your hearts. I can stand five minutes and have a conversation with you for five minutes and I will tell you exactly what is in your heart. Again, I state, show me the contents of your hearts and I'll be able to tell you why your life is in the condition that it is in. Not necessarily in a bad way. If it's good, it's good. If it's bad, then there's stuff that we need to look at. Are you guys with me? But now that being said, there's some good news in all of this because by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and by the sacrificial act of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary and by blood that was shed, your ledger have been cleansed. And you can, by the power of the Holy Spirit, indeed change your life. The Bible says this in the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, NIV. And we all know the scripture so very well. I'm just laying a foundation, stay with me. And it says, trust in the Lord with all your hearts and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight if you want to change your life change your hearts i'm going to say that again 
if you want to change your life, change your hearts. Again, I state everything in life, both physically and spiritually, will be determined by the condition of your heart. But now when we use or make use of the term heart, we must be careful. It will require further interpretation because you have both a physical and spiritual heart. Amen. And so the heart in a physical sense gives life to the physical body. It is responsible for the transference of blood and oxygen to all of the organs of the physical body. Meaning that if, if the heart stops permanently for a long time, bodily life will end. It is exactly the same with your spiritual heart. It is responsible for the transference of blood, the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it is responsible for the transference of oxygen to all of your spiritual life. What is the oxygen in reference to? It is known as the breath of God. Ruach HaKodesh. It is speaking about the spirit of the living God. Are you guys with me? Say my heart. But now here's the thing. And I trust that you guys are ready as we are about to enter into a fast. How many of you will join this fast? I would like to encourage each and every one of you. That being said, let me go deeper into this message. I'm just laying a foundation. I know this is still milk dying on there. I want to get your hearts and your spirit open. I'm going to get into something that is severe and serious. Are you guys with me still? Amen. When we speak about the hearts in a spiritual sense, it touches on two main dimensions. In the physical, you have the heart, it's one thing. But in your spiritual heart, it touches on two main dimensions. First, it is in reference to the spirit man. The deepest part of you. It touches the core part of who you are. But now it's also in reference to your soul. It is rather like this. Let me put it in place in plain and simple context. It is the way that your spirit connects and communicates with your soul. And your soul consists of your will, your emotions, and of your intellect. Now this is important to understand as we get into this. Are you guys with me? Amen. And I know that we know this. And I hope that by now you understand that you are a body, a soul, and a spirit. That you are a spirit that have a soul and that you live in a body. But now here's where the problem comes in. The flesh has a nature of its own. And that is the thing that we constantly and every day must work to put to death. When we say that you must die to yourself, it means that you must die to the will and the nature of your flesh. Your flesh does have a nature of itself. And that is Paul, why Paul so eloquently stated that, you know, there's this war going on internally between my flesh and my spirits. Come on, this is a war that we all feel and experience every day of our lives, where the soul will be pulling you back. Or the, sorry, your flesh will be pulling you back into the world. Come on, there's that constant pulling, trying to convince you to go back into the world, or to, to fall back into your old lifestyle. And on the other hand, you have your spirit that is constantly pulling towards the things of God and the desire of God. And Paul said that there's this war going on between my members on the inside of me. And this, the, the flesh is in constant contradiction to what the, the spirit desire. And the spirit is in constant contradiction to what the flesh desire. Now yes, the problem is because the thing that you feed the most will grow the most. You see, your soul is caught up in the middle of this war. And it will lean towards the one that you feed the most. If you feed the flesh the most, your soul will submit. Your soul will submit under the thing that you feed the most. If you feed the flesh the most, it will submit under it. But if you feed the Spirit more, it will submit under the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit. And your life will be governed accordingly. Your mind will be in that same flow. And so we have people, unfortunately, sitting with a day in a day and age with a generation that are lazy. And they do not feed their spirit man. And so we have a lot of 
Christians that have spiritually sick hearts, that have spiritually unhealthy hearts. Are you guys with me? Listen, the Bible says this, Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23, NIV. And it says, above all else, say above all else, God, your heart. Why? For everything you do flows out of your heart. Above all else means that it is principle. It takes top priority as this is the thing that will influence every dimension in an aspect of your life both physically and spiritually. It is the very thing that can potentially prevent you from truly knowing God. It is the very thing that can potentially limit the presence of God in your life. It is the very thing that can potentially limit the supernatural power of God to go into operation in and through your life. Which means that if you're a part of this ministry where the mandate and the anointing that is upon this house is to bring forth a supernatural encounter to this generation will place you in a very bad spot. Amen. And I want to preach. I want to teach because I need you to get this thing. Proverbs 4.23, the exact same verse, but put it in New King James. It says, keep your hearts with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Now the word keep or the word God means to put a garrison around your heart. It means to build fortified walls around your hearts that have watchmen upon them that constantly keep, constantly and continually keep watch and that is constantly and continually on God for unwanted things, for intruders that wants to gain access. It must constantly keep God against things that wants to make its way into your heart, that wants to corrupt and defile the heart that will prevent the presence of God to be evident in your life. Don't drift off. Let me open my water for those who drift off. The Bible says this. Now I'm going to get into it. I had to lay a foundation. Let's just check the time. Pressure is real this morning. Luke chapter 6, verse 43 to 45. New King James. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Verse 44. For every tree is known by its fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorn, or nor do they gather grapes from bramble bush. Verse 45. Now listen to this. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart, say good treasure, brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of his, the mouth speaks. For out of the abundance of his, hearts the mouth speaks in the niv it says for out of for the mouth speak with what the heart is full of are you guys with me listen your attitude and your communication will always reveal the contents and the condition of your heart and that is why i stated earlier on that give me five minutes with you and i will ask you a few questions and i will wait for you to speak you see people speak a lot I've seen people that they can take a story from there and they can bring it right to there. And all that you are doing is that you're revealing constantly the condition of your hearts and the contents of your hearts. Five minutes, I'll tell you exactly the relationship that you have with God. Guaranteed, I can prove it here right now. I've said this previously and received a lot of persecution on those words. I will gladly, for those who want to persecute me on that, come, I'll, I'll put it to the test. Are you guys with me? It's scriptural. It says that your mouth will always throw out the things that is in the heart. Listen, you can use this thing in your favor. And I'm getting off track and I don't have the time. But you can use this thing in your favor. Because if you struggle to determine or discern what are my thoughts, what are God's thoughts, and what are the thoughts of the devil, I don't know. I'm getting so confused because there's an avalanche 
of things that is coming through my mind. What is of me and what is not of me? It's easy. Go into your inner room, close the door and have a conversation with yourself because your mouth will reveal with what is in your heart. And you can quickly determine what is of you and what is not of you. And based upon what comes out of your mouth at that moment should help you and encourage you to get rid of the things, the evil treasures that is not of God so that the Holy Spirit can come, come into those areas and reign and rule in those parts so that you can start to walk in newness of life. You can use, always use scripture in your favor. God have given us the Holy Scriptures so that you can use it, clothe yourself with it and walk in constant victory. Use the Bible, the living Word of God to transform your heart. You guys with me? And so the scripture reveals two main conditions of the heart. Let me just get back on track. It reveals a heart that is filled with good treasure and it reveals a heart that is filled with evil treasure. Now a heart filled with good, good treasure will be filled with what? Love, joy, peace, forbearance, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What are those? Fruits of the Spirit. Let me add to it. Humility, purity, obedience, righteousness this is our heart after God's own heart some people are drifting off be careful I've got my water ready I will not allow the enemy to take this word from you I will as a pastor defend you and if I see the enemy is coming in starting to steal a word from you I will intervene so you best be on your own God otherwise I will step in as the God standing on that wall watching and keeping watch on your behalf are you guys with me amen a heart filled with evil treasure will be full of what i'm not going to scream and shout not this morning will be filled with offense unforgiveness disobedience pride disrespect dishonor rebellion stubbornness selfishness constant murmuring and complaining now listen to this part doubts and or unbelief especially towards god and his word this is known as a hardened heart you guys with me this is why the bible says that we must continually and consistently examine our hearts in fact before you can take part of communion the bible says examine your hearts meaning that i must analyze the contents of my heart to find what is in my heart that is in contradiction to the living God, to God and His Word, and that I need to get those things out. Are you guys with me? Anything that can possibly hinder His presence. Amen. You see, many people take this thing so lightly, and they overlook this thing, yet it steers the entire course of your life. Listen to this, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, New King James. Again, I state both physically and spiritually. And it says, as His divine power has given to us all things that what? Pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, verse 4, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Say life and godliness. It means both physically and spiritually. Are you guys with me? Say the hearts. Listen, the heart is the very thing that will determine the boundaries of your participation to the divine nature. You cannot afford to overlook this thing or to take it lightly. I'm going to say that again. Your heart is the very thing that will establish the boundaries of your participation to this divine nature. Can I have an amen? Now, I'm going to level with you for a moment. And the truth is this, that each and every one of us, including myself, every day do have both a good treasure and an evil treasure constantly at work. You live in a fallen state. Where at times you will reveal the good treasure. And that obviously comes, now I need you to listen. I'm not going to get into what I want to get into. 
where at times you will reveal the good treasure that comes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But then there will be times that you will reveal the evil treasure. And that comes from the fallen state, from the nature of the flesh. And those areas should show you that those are the areas that needs the intervention of God. Where the Holy Spirit must come in and reign and rule over those areas. And remove the evil treasure as I've stated. So that you can truly start to walk in newness of life. I mean, listen to this. James chapter 3. Verse 9 and 10, New King James. James chapter 3, verse 9 and verse 10, New King James. I'm going to give you a lot of scripture this morning. And it says, speaking about the tongue. And let me remind you that what the heart is filled with, the mouth will speak. And it says, with, thee, with it we bless our God and Father. And with it we curse men. Let's just stop there for a moment. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men. Come on now. The tongue. This is something we all need to watch out for. We tend to want to just bless God and we think that we're all holy and in right standing, yet the next day we will curse man and please understand many of you might sit here and think oh but I don't curse man you know I don't use foul language I don't curse or cuss curse means that if you speak of someone else in ill intent if you slander or gossip anything that you say or do against someone else that will devalue them in the character and in the nature to someone else is cursing that man and you have no right nor no place to do such things but yet we tend to think that oh i'm not in that category think again are you guys with me who have been made in the similitude of god meaning in the likeness of god you see you have to come to the understanding that the one that you so easily speak out against that one is also made in the image and the character and in the likeness of God. The moment that you start abusing even the ones closest to you, bear in mind that before you start releasing words that will devalue and break down, that the one you're speaking to stands in the image, the character and the likeness of Christ. So who are you judging? Let's face the reality of this thing now. Amen. I know. I told you it's not a hallelujah message. Again, I state, remember that the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. In fact, the Bible says this, Matthew chapter 15, NIV. Matthew chapter 15, verse 11 and verse 18, not 218. We don't have time to cover all the in-betweens. And it says, what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them but what comes out of their mouth that is what defiles them verse 18 but the things that come out of the person's mouth comes from the hearts and these defile them that is why it's so important that you continually and consistently fill your hearts with the word of God so that what comes out of your mouth is nothing but truth and life do not waste your words on gossip do not waste your words on slander do not waste your words in judging others keep the focus on yourself and the presence and the relationship that you have with him and make sure that that is in order amen so what are the things that we need to watch out for obviously all the things that i've mentioned earlier on that you find within the evil treasure i've only mentioned but a few things these are known as fiery arrows that the enemy constantly throw at believers. There are many more fiery arrows that the enemy forms daily, designed to corrupt the hearts. It is designed to limit the presence of God. It is designed to cause you to fall and backslide, to fall back into your old lifestyle. It is designed to remove you from the very presence of God. But there is one subtle weapon that I want to make mention of in this morning, and this is what I want to get into, that have taken many believers out. And that subtle weapon is known as unbelief. Say unbelief. Now, please note that unbelief is a fruit of offense. Meaning, 
that if offense is left and not dealt with for a long time, it will lead to rebellion, disobedience, and unbelief. Now I need you to listen. We find this true in John's life. The very man who announced Jesus Christ as the Lamb that is about to be slain for the sin of this world. The very man appointed and ordained by God to pave the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. Finding himself in prison and he's offended. He's offended because Jesus' ministry produced results. It preached a more powerful message. There were signs, miracles, and wonders. And he finds himself in this place where they have taken offense in prison. And he's asking the question, the very man who announced the Lord Jesus Christ, because of un- offense, led him, to, him into a place of unbelief, saying, go and ask the Lord Jesus if he is still the one. Or should we wait for another? I need you to understand the severity of this thing. You see, sadly, the majority of Christians struggle to believe God in some area or another. Now, many might even on that say, oh, no, I don't have unbelief. No, I trust fully. I believe God. Listen, if you do not pray, if you do not spend time in the Word on a daily basis, if you do not fast, if you do not give as according to the instructions given by God, if you do not follow biblical principles the way that God has said, that if you do these things, it will go well with you all the days of your life, then it means you have unbelief. Because you would have done it if you believed. The reason why many people do not pray or get into the Word is because they do not believe that it can really touch or change them. And now we sit with something that is known as the problem of faith. Because many people do have faith and they do trust and believe in God that He exists and that He's real and that He's true. And, and they, they believe that God can do the things written in the Word and all the blessings recorded there are only because they've seen it done in other people's lives. But they do not truly have faith and believe that He can do it for them. If you truly believe that prayer will change your life, you will engage in it permanently and you will become prayer. If you truly believe that the Word of God can transform your life, you will get into it like there was no tomorrow. If you truly believe that fasting will crucify the nature of the flesh, you will, I want to say this, never eat again. If you truly believe that if I give and that I sow into the kingdom of God, that it will bring breakthrough into my finances. If you truly believe it, it is a principle that you will apply with joy. See, let's, let's, let's level. We don't do it because we don't believe, truly believe, that it will change us. Yet, oh, yeah, yeah, I can see unbelief. I've been saved. I had an encounter with God. There's no unbelief here. Uh-uh. This thing will limit the presence of God in your life. It's the very thing that will prevent you from walking in newness of life. The way that God has ordained it. I have to bring this thing into awareness. Are you guys with me? Amen. We, it's, it's like this. Let me explain it like this. What's the time? I'm doing good. Don't worry. I think I'll make it. It's like this. We all know the story about the father who cried out to the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, please save my boy. He's he's possessed by a demon. And many times this demon will cast my boy into the fire or throw him into the water as to hurt him, cause him harm or even kill him. Please, if it is possible, the man said, what did he say? If it is possible, can you please help me? And Jesus responds, Mark chapter 9, verse 23, King James. If you can only but believe, all things are possible. To him, all things are possible to him that believes. And in the very next verse, the man responds saying, My God, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Why did he say that? He believes Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. He has seen him produce many signs, miracles, healings, and wonders. He has seen it with his own eyes. 
He just does not believe that God can do it for him. Help me. Help me overcome my God. This is my prayer for you. That you may know him more. Help me overcome my unbelief. What I have doubted you. You know, when I've prepared this message, I found myself the last two weeks on my knees weeping. Saying, God, forgive me. For there has been doubt and unbelief in my heart. I'm so sorry. For I have not trusted you. Having stood on this pulpit and proclaimed your word, but yet myself, I've been in areas of doubt and unbelief, and I'm so sorry. May you forgive me and lift me up once more. Help me overcome my unbelief. And what happened? Jesus stepped in with grace. And he said, come out of him. And the man had an encounter by his son that was delivered. And I realized that this is the thing that constantly will produce belief in your life and in your heart. It is having constant, continual encounters with the living God. Man, you must become hungry for Him. You, there must be a desire, there must be a hunger, an anticipation for a move of God in your life. I pray that there will be a hunger being stirred up in your hearts even in this day. That as I'm preaching that this word will not condemn you, but inspire and rather encourage you to want to know Him more and to be close to Him. Help me overcome my unbelief. Come on, many times we feel exactly the same. Like this father. Are you guys with me? It is like, for example like this. Is it, is it hard for you to believe and trust for God? For the salvation of a lost family member? Do you find it hard to believe that God will provide for all your material needs? Even though he said, do not worry about tomorrow. Do you find it difficult to perceive God as your healer and deliverer? Do you truly believe that God can save your marriage, that He can save your business, that He can save your job, that He can bless you financially? Do you believe that the blessings recorded in Scripture is indeed applicable to you and is indeed for you? Remember that God said that we must believe in Him, trust Him with all our hearts. I'm not saying these things to condemn you. Please don't take it like that. Not even to make you feel condemned. May that not be the case. It is to bring awareness and to keep you alert to something that the enemy might use against many. I don't know. You will know. And so that by giving you this knowledge, you'll say, ah, oh, that's it. Now I've got it. That's what happened to me. And you can get the Holy Spirit to intervene, to reign and rule over those areas. Can I have an amen? I need you to understand the severity of an unbelieving heart. Amen. Listen, the Bible says this. Unbelief is this. No, this is going to be odd. Unbelief is this. It is departure from the living God. Put on the screen for me Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12, New King James. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart, meaning the evil treasure is in control. Are you guys with me? An evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Unbelief will always, always lead to disobedience. And disobedience is simply a statement that I do not trust the one we have given the instruction. That is disobedience. Are you guys with me? Obe Listen, unbelief is not a condition of the mind. Unbelief is a condition of the heart. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 verse 10 King James, For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. And once it has been said in my heart, and I'm convinced, then my mouth will speak accordingly. And with a mouth, confession is made unto salvation. In the same verse. Amen. Unbelief is doubting God and His Word. It will cut you off from the presence of God and it will limit you to experience the blessings that He has God ordained for each and every one of us. Are you guys with me? 
Now, what is the origin of unbelief? And we all know this is when man questioned the truth of God's word in the Garden of Eden. You see, the enemy presented Adam and Eve with what? A suggestion. It was a very subtle suggestion, but it contradicted the word of God and his instruction in every facet, form and way. And the moment man believed the lie, they fell into disobedience and unbelief. Are you guys with me? Towards you, towards God and His Word. And so, we find that even from that moment forwards, many being disobedient through Scripture, and the root of it being unbelief. Come on now. It is exactly the same today. We still see this thing in manifestation. You see, a person with an unbelieving heart will not be able to understand spiritual realities. It is impossible. If you cannot even relate to the words that I'm speaking right now, it is a sign. Because an unbelieving heart, an offended heart, a hardened heart cannot perceive the things of God. In fact, such an individual consider any spiritual thing or anything that is God foolishness. The Bible says it. Because they must be spiritually discerned. Amen. Now here's the thing, just to put you at ease. And this is the part that I had to get to before I can leave. And this is not the entire message, but nonetheless, we get two major types of unbelief recorded in Scripture. First one is unbelief caused by ignorance. Ignorance is everything that every individual inherits because of the fall of man. Amen. Now, the enemy of ignorance is the truth of God's Word. And so the antidote to ignorance is a transformed heart that comes through the Word of God. Listen, this is a process that will be sparked by having encounters with God. Are you guys with me? You need the living word. You need to fast. You need to pray. And you need to get the word on the inside of you. It is the only thing that can transform the heart. When I speak about God, I'm also speaking about your mind. Are you guys with me? Amen. Listen, the moment you set your heart to understanding, I can guarantee this. God will step in. He will confirm His word that is alive. Only the one that you've accepted and that you have believed and trust in. He will confirm it by signs, miracles, and wonders that will accompany it. The Bible says, in book of Mark, chapter 16, verse 20. Then all the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them. And He confirmed His word by the signs that accompanied it. That is out of the NIV. Are you guys with me? Amen. Say my hearts. Come on, say again. Say my hearts. We see this with Paul. When he persecuted the Christians, he said this. Listen to this. Before he announced, you know, before he had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ and he was converted, he said the following, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 13, NIV. And he's saying this, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. I believe that as with the father, with the demon possessed boy, It is the same with many of us. Are you guys with me? I truly believe that, that as with Him, that no one truly wants to have a life of unbelief. Come on now. I'm, I can with all certainty, I hope, say that each and every one of you sitting here can say, I, I want no unbelief in me. My, I, want, I want only believe and trust in the living God. May unbelief not find me. My unbelief is stricken with blindness and not know my address. May not be able to locate me. Okay? Okay? Listen, I believe that is each and every one of you. And so I do firmly believe that as born again believers, for those of you who might be working against the Word of God, and God even Himself do so out of ignorance rather than out of wickedness. I do believe it. Are you guys with me? For example, Many remain sick simply because they don't know experiential knowledge what Christ has done for them on the cross. 
They don't know what the Word has got to say about the situation. I'm using a simple example now. It's out of ignorance that they remain in that position. Unbelief is simply you being in a position of ignorance for many. The majority. Place of darkness. Ignorance is darkness. You need light in those areas, meaning I need the Word of God to contradict that part that I'm still battling with. Are you guys with me? Amen. Now God forgives this type of unbelief according to His mercy as Paul has stated in this verse. Are you guys with me? And then we get the other one. Unbelief caused by rebellion in the hearts. Now, what is rebellion? Rebellion is a blatant decision not to believe in God. It is a decision that you make that I will not trust in Him and that I will not trust in His Word. And even more than that, it is you making a deliberate decision that I will do contrary to what the Word says. That is rebellion. Now, I'm going to touch now on a very sensitive topic because many think, no, 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 okay, at least I'm not there. Now, this is not me trying to point out that you are indeed that. But I need to bring stuff into context. It is an instruction to bring all your tithe into the storehouse. And if you have heard I say those words every single Sunday, and still choose not to apply. It is what it is. And you will need to repent of it. And ask God to step in. And ask the Holy Spirit to help you. To deliver you of a hardened heart. That kicks against God and His Word. If the Bible says, pray for the sick and they will be healed. And I do not, even though I know I should, it is an instruction, then I am deliberately kicking against. See, I want to put things in context. The devil is in the detail and that's where we miss it. And the enemy is sitting back, having accomplished exactly what he wanted to in your life. Because of a lack of ignorance. You can no longer say that from this moment forward, again I state the enemy, you see that, he, I can see men, is like, no, I'm not saying that to, do, to, uh, to be condescending at all. You cannot leave this service today and say, I did not know. Or I did not understand. I cannot put this thing in more plain terms. I cannot present it more simply. It is what it is. If you know God's Word is saying something and I am not doing it, then I am blatantly and deliberately kicking against that. And that is nothing but rebellion. And if I leave rebellion for too long, and will consume you, it will become a part of you, you become a rebellion in your very expression. Come on, we live in a day and age with a generation that become an expression of rebellion. They kick against authority, they kick against instructions. This is the reality we live in. It's because rebellion have been left too long. It's because there's fathers that have not taken up their rightful place in the household. That do not stand in the structure of God the way that He have ordained it. And that do not train their children in the ways of God. And so rebellion is flowing through effortlessly. And while the enemy is sitting back enjoying the show. It's flowing through from generation to generation corrupting families. Unbelief. cannot afford to ignore this principle any longer. <laughs> you see why I found myself on my knees. I'm telling you, I was on my knees for the last two weeks, weeping, repenting. David, I need to be sensitive to the words that I use. 
after he messed up with Bathsheba. Psalm 51. We find the prayer of repentance. Part of that repentance, verse 10. Let's put it on the screen for me. Psalm chapter 51, verse 10. I want to show you this. This is how you this is how you speak. True repentance. True repentance and humility is the bedrock for a steadfast spirit. If you want to have an unshaken, steadfast, immovable spirit, develop a heart of true repentance and humility before God every day. Are you guys with me? In fact, start with me verse 1. And this is not part of the notes, but anyway. Where's the time you see now? And it says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. This verse, this chapter have been my, my chapter that I've pondered on, prayed on for the last month. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, Lord, and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Before I was brought forth in iniquity and my sin and my mother conceived me, behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, meaning in your hearts, your inward parts is speaking about your soul and your spirit. Behold, my God, you desire that truth be found in my spirit. The truth be found in my heart. The truth be found in my soul. And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Perch me. Okay, and it carries on. We get to verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And in a renew and steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. He understood that for him to remain steadfast in the spirit will require true repentance and humility. Are you guys with me? A rebellious person will speak like this. They will say they don't believe in God. They don't need God. And they can do things by themselves. Are you guys with me? Remember this. Rebellion was the original sin. And the cause for Satan to be cast out from the presence of God. Don't think it will be any different from you with you. Amen. We see our stubborn Israel because of rebellion, not believing in God and in His Word, in what He have promised many a times over. I mean, they have seen the signs, the miracles and wonders. How will your life be if you see a pillar of fire by night coming before you every single day and a pillar of cloud in day every single day? What will you do? How, what will, how will your life be impacted? If you stand before the ocean and suddenly the waters depart, as you see the hand of God and the breath of God came through, come on, how will your life changed? Let me tell you, it will not change nothing. Stubborn Israel, yet every single time because of their unbelief, unbelief not dealt with will lead, will lead to rebellion. And they kicked against the word of God and his instructions that said, go into this land. I have given it to you as an inheritance. And I am the Lord your God. And I will go before you and I will drive out your enemies from before your face. You will not even need to face this battle because I am the Lord your God that stands with you and that will deliver you from your enemies. But, no, Israel, no better. Twelve spies, come, ten came back with a bad report. No, we, we refuse. We will not listen to God, and He does not know what He's saying. 
an entire generation was prevented from going into the promised land because of rebellion, disrespect and unbelief. You see, many people think they can continue in the rebellion against God without any consequences. The Bible is very clear on this topic of those who persist in unbelief. Are you guys with me? Now please, this is what I want to close off with. Understand that we, speaking in this context, after you were presented with the truth, can you hear me? I'm speaking in the context now with rebellion after you were presented with the truth, but still refuse to repent and still blatantly choose not to believe and turn the other way. There's hope. God is slow to anger. I thank Him for that. Abiding in love. I have to bring this under your attention. I hope that you receive it as such, coming from a place of love. So how can I be free from a heart of unbelief? Now, because of time, I can't, I can't break it open. I can only give you the points. I do apologize. Maybe I'll break it a bit open tonight before I get into the message that I actually have got prepared for tonight. Amen. Point number one. How can I be free from a heart of unbelief? Recognize our state of unbelief and repent. Point number two, renounce the spirit of unbelief. Point number three, receive the spirit of faith. Faith is something you must receive. Amen. Point number four, I can't break it open now. Receive the anointed word. When I say receive, meaning that you must receive it in your heart, and in your spirit, not just listen and hear it. Amen. Point number five, speak in other tongues on a regular basis. If you can establish that as divine cycles, belief will not find your address of unbelief. You will never fall into it. I guarantee it. I'll break it open a bit more tonight as a foundation to the message. Amen. Are you guys still alive? Okay, I hope that it encouraged. Listen, it came out of love. So either you are thinking, dear God, it's easy. Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me for what I've done. He, he will forgive you. He will step in and He will lift you up by His Spirit and He will pour out His grace once again and once more. He's unconditional. He's un conditional love will surround you all the days of your life I'm merely giving this to you as awareness and to keep you alert so that the enemy can no longer limit you okay, can I have an amen okay if you have received something just give the Lord a praise offering amen encounter church let's give Jesus Christ a shout of praise in this place amen amen I want everyone in this building to stand, those of you online, to watch your screen because this is the most important part of the service. You know, I remember in 2012 when my parents forced me to go to a youth meeting. My heart was full of rebellion. My heart was full of hurt. And I never, ever wanted to go to a youth meeting or youth service because it was not for me. I was too cool as a young person to go to a youth meeting. And I remember I always said to God, I'm not going to fall over. I will not fall over. I will not surrender because I don't believe in this. I, al I was always a Christian, but I never believed in the supernatural power of God. And I remember we still stayed in Alberton and it was a small little church that we attended. And it was the first youth night and my parents was like, you know, God, maybe you should go. I was like, okay, let me try this. And um, we were like 50 young people, just radical for Christ in that time. But I was standing exactly what Pastor Martin said this morning, full of rebellion, full of hurt, full of offense, not believing that God can encounter me. And in that moment, the pastor said, if you want to receive Jesus Christ and experience God, I want you to come to the front. So I said, you know what? I've got nothing to lose. Um, 
I went to the front and as I was standing there, I said, well, God, if you are real, if you are real, I want to have a relationship with you. And in that moment, my legs started shaking and I thought to myself, what is this now? Because I said, I will not experience this. And I was standing there and as the pastor came past and I said, Jesus, I give you my life. I experienced the presence and the power of God for the very first time and I fell to the floor and I encountered Jesus Christ. And from that day forward, my life was never the same again. It is an act of surrender. It's an act of saying, God, I give you everything. I give you my pain. I give you my rejection because I believe that you are my healer. But you have to experience that. So this morning, I want every single one of you, those of you online, to stay connected. And I want everyone in this building to close your eyes because maybe you are in this place this morning and your heart was full of rebellion. Your heart is full of hurt and you do not believe in Jesus. You have never experienced Jesus. You have never spoken to Him. Or maybe you are in a place where you did have a relationship with God. You were on fire, but years went past and things happened. You went through a divorce and you went through things and you drifted off and you are not on fire anymore. But this morning you have an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ again, to recommit your life to the King of Kings. So if you are in this place right now and you say, Gerard, like I was in 2012 when my heart was hardened and you say, Gerard, I want to give my life to Jesus again. I want to give it to Him. I want to surrender my heart to Him. If that is you, I want you to lift up your hand. And those of you online, we've got online, I see the hand, I see the hand. I, oh, the online leaders are also ready to minister to you. So those of you online, just respond. I see hands going up or over. This is between you and God. When you leave this place, I see hands going up or over. This is between you and God. I see hands going up or over. After that, that decision I made, that evening I was in my bed and as I was sleeping, the Holy Spirit woke me up and I started praying in tongues without any anyone praying for me because it's about the presence of God and the presence of God is tangible in this place right now and I see many hands going up still leaders I want you to go to them quickly I want to give it a few seconds come on this is beautiful this is what it's about the presence of God you don't have to hold on to the pain the hurt you are not alone in your situation this morning and I want us all, and those of you online, to pray together. There will be a person that will stand with you and will pray with you and connect with you this morning. And I want us all to pray together as a church. Say, Father, this morning, under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, Father, I surrender my life. I surrender my will. I surrender my heart. Jesus, I give you my pain. Jesus, I give you my past. Jesus, from this moment forward, the past is in the past. And I hold on to every promise. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for standing up that you're alive so that I can have a relationship with you in Jesus' mighty name. Can we give Jesus Christ a shout of praise in this place? Come on. Hey. Amen. Count this close our eyes. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your power. I pray even this afternoon that you'll speak to us. May the words that Pastor Martin spoke this morning fall on fruitful ground. Father, may we do introspection in our inner room. If there's anything that is grieving you, if there's anything that is standing in the way for us, so when we return tonight, we will have a supernatural encounter with your Spirit in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, encounter. We will see you again this afternoon at 5 p.m. If you would like to give into this ministry, we have made giving your tithes, seed, or offering as simple and effortless as possible. You can simply log on to EncounterChurch.co.za or LeonDupria.com and click on the Give button. Here we show you the different ways to give. It's so easy. You will find giving options for local or international giving. PayFast is a fast and secure way for South Africans to give. You can give once off or make a recurring donation. Here you will find the Zapper and SnapScan QR codes as a simple and effortless way to scan and give into the ministry. 
If you prefer to make an electronic transfer, the banking details of our various campuses and the Visionary Fund are also readily available. For giving internationally, Cash App is one of our fast and simple giving platforms. PayPal is another method for quick and easy giving internationally. You can use your PayPal account or you can give straight from your credit card. DonorBox is also available, which accepts a variety of international giving methods. For those who would like to take hands with us and become a part of the incredible work that God is doing, become a friend and partner of Encounter and Leon Dupria. We have many partnership tiers available to suit your preference. Our friends and partners receive exclusive materials from Leon Dupria, as well as private live streams and exclusive events. Thank you for being part of what God is doing.